Oh, there we go. Hey. Hey. Hey, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to the Creating Peaceful Money panel. I will be the moderator. My name is Jessica Solomon. We'll start with just a brief round of intros as all these guys and myself, a gal, have a number of interesting things that we've done in the space uh, that relate to creating peaceful money. So I actually began my career in crypto as the first community manager at MakerDAO. I started at the launch of Single, single Collateral Die in December 2017. Since then, um, I've been working in the space on a number of different DeFi protocols uh, and including some fun stuff and NFTs and all that jazz. Um, and now we have Reza. Reza, do you want to tell us a little bit about your impressive background? Absolutely. Um, hi, I'm Reza. I am the DAO lead for Reflexer and currently am working on Let's Get High, uh, which is another fork of Reflexer. And um, yeah, that's me excited to be here. Hey, I'm Joseph Sharizzi. I'm the founder of Open Dollar. Uh, we're a new over-collateralized stablecoin on Arbitrum backed by liquid staking tokens like Lido ETH and Rocket Pool ETH. Uh, we built Open Dollar on the JEB framework that Reflexer and Rai is also built on. Uh, and we're bringing new tradable CDPs to the market. Um, before this, I was working at uh, OpenSea on the marketplace behind uh, Seaport. And I've contributed to uh, MetaCartel, um, a few other DAOs like uh, Raid Guild and uh, Consensus, Gitcoin, uh, and really excited to be on the panel here today. We're excited to have you. Uh, hello, my name is Amin Soleimani. Uh, I worked at Consensus for a bit and then uh, have built some payment products. I'm uh, the CEO of Spank Chain. I built the, <coughs> we was one of the co-founders of Reflexer, summoner of Moloch DAO, and now working on Let's Get High with Reza and excited for the uh, peaceful money <laughs> collaboration that we have going on. As we all are. So I'm going to start with a little bit of historical context. In recent history, there have been four monumental events in currency and monetary policy. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank was created. 1971, Nixon eliminated the gold standard and made it illegal to back the dollar. 2011, 2011, the Bitcoin distributed network started mining and transacting. In 2015, we had the launch of programmable currency, being Ethereum. And in the future, when we actually think people will look back at all these events, what do our panelists think will be the most significant advancements in currency and monetary policy to come? I'll take this one to start. Um, I think that the golden age of central banking and currency management is actually ahead of us, not behind us, uh, because uh, for far too long, we just assume that the central bankers know what they're talking about when they come out and ask us to have faith in them and tell us what the interest rates should be. But what we've uh, discovered and proven and demonstrated empirically with Rai is that you can actually completely automate the monetary policy for a currency. And it more or less works fine. So I think in the future, any idiot is going to be able to run a currency. And that'll result in like a printing press Cambrian explosion of knowledge around currency management. And that'll be what results in the golden age of, of currency. All right. Can, can I add? Yeah, I would love for you to add to that. Um, I think all of human history is going to be separated into two time periods. The time uh, before Ethereum, where the only possible way to enforce an agreement between two people is with violence. And all of human history expanding into the, you know, humans expanding into the universe forever uh, and being able to enforce agreements with math using smart contracts or other technology that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and so we're actually like right at the very, very beginning of this new golden age of peaceful money where math enforces agreements uh, instead of violence. Well, I'm excited for this new age, but I'd like to know what is peaceful money? And maybe we can start by defining a negative. What is peaceful money versus non-peaceful money? And I've heard the term flat coin touted around by 
a number of different important people. What do you guys think of that? Um, we don't really like flat coin. Uh, we're going to start calling it float coins. We are all float coins. Uh, not really vibing with the Balaji direction at the moment. Um, as far as like peaceful money versus violent money or non-peaceful money, really, if a currency requires a military to enforce it, then it's essentially being the, the value of the currency is being backed up by violence. And so the idea with peaceful money is we, we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to you know, use the Navy or the entire US military to enforce, or even sanctions, <laughs> to enforce the value of the money. We can now just use smart contracts to enforce them autonomously. And as long as we are smart about the collateral, uh, I think we can continue to create money that doesn't need thugs to back it up. Cool. Um, so getting more into floating coins versus flat coins, which we might not like, does it actually make sense to peg to an inflation rate? And what would be the trade-offs if we were to peg to a, say, global inflation rate? So how do you define what an inflation rate is, right? Is it the rate of the U.S. dollar, like more of it being printed? Because, you know, most U.S. dollars were printed since 2020. So, you know, inflation wasn't, wasn't you know, 100% at any time in the last you know, few years, it's been like 15%. And who are the economists that are telling us at the Federal Reserve what the inflation rate is and how much, you know, how much less money you have in your bank account? Uh, I think just defining those kind of rates is just giving more power to bankers right. that we don't necessarily have to do. Um, and uh, in terms of like crypto, like the demand for centrally backed stable coins is mostly from payments and from those type of transactions. You know, USDC is mostly used for payments and for settling payments. But the demand for decentralized stable coins like RAI and Open Dollar and potentially High, uh, most of that demand comes from meeting the demand for, the un for leverage on the underlying collateral. Right, and so these are our financial tools um, that uh, are probably more attractive to the people who are creating them. Right, every time you deposit collateral into Open Dollar or Rye um, or, or other CDPs, right, you're depositing this collateral. You're minting new stable coins. So the people actually creating the stable coins. Um, don't want to mint against something that is more expensive, right? That, that makes their debt positions worse off uh, and, and um, less stable, basically, right? So, so I want to build something that is for depositors and, um, you know, gives, gives access to capital that normal people don't necessarily um, always have access to, right? When Jeff Bezos wants to buy a new $500 million super yacht, which he did, he doesn't sell $500 million of Amazon stock. He borrows against it and doesn't pay taxes. Uh, so, you know, wouldn't it be nice if everybody had access to those same type of financial um, services uh, and the same type of, the same type of actually stable, stable coins? Yeah. That would be nice. I'd like to add a little bit of uh, color. So, like, Balaji came up with this term flat coin. In his uh, definition, I think it means, you know, CPI denominated, essentially, pegged to the inflation rate, uh, the index of your basket of, you know, toilet paper, cheeseburgers, whatever. Uh, and so, like, you know, that index is manipulated, like Joseph said, and also uh, it's hard to borrow against because it's an increasing number, so people might not want it. Um, and so this brings us back to, like, float coins. And the idea of a float coin is that it's, it's short for controlled peg floating stable coin. But that's a lot of words. Uh, so we just say float coin. Uh, and the cool thing about a float coin in how Rye is designed and how High is designed uh, is that it can basically find the equilibrium interest rate that both the holders want and the borrowers want. And uh, expressing it in you know, a dollar is sort of fine for that because it, even though it is denominated in a dollar, it's not always pegged to exactly one dollar. The currency can appreciate in value or depreciate in value based on uh, the market forces that are at play. Uh, how much people want to borrow against it versus how much people want to hold the coins. Uh, and so I think it's a novel mechanism to achieve stability with, that you can basically fully automate um, and 
yeah, it's a better way to achieve sound money uh, for, for any monetary policy. Right. So in summary, it sounds like our panelists aren't a fan of the consumer price index for defining inflation because they feel it's a manipulable by bankers or politicians that are trying to get voted in. And also, it sounds like the consumer price index actually changes with the market of the goods being priced. So digital monetary transactions offer convenience, speed, low cost, but with them does come a loss of privacy. Big banks, large corporations, and the government know how much money we make and what we spend it on. The blockchain does not solve the privacy problem uh, since all of it is on a public record and people can basically see everything that we do. The transactions are preserved. What steps can we, as the blockchain community, truly take to deploy the advantages of digital money, that being convenience, speed, low cost, but at the same time to preserve privacy without running afoul of government entities that truly respond to any perceived threat on their ability to monitor financial transactions by locking people up? We might be able to think of a couple examples of that. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think that in America, we've gotten pretty used to the surveillance state, um, but it's not necessarily a global thing. Uh, there was one Swiss central banker who I met, and his plans for the central bank digital currency for Switzerland included privacy from the central bank itself as a feature that he was pitching to the users of the currency. Because what you lose when you have a full surveillance system is that you risk every single person's financial transaction history as in a giant honeypot that can be hacked and exposed and is a threat to people in the armed forces or people looking for abortions in states that it might not be allowed. And that is not, a, I don't know, a great equilibrium for us to settle with. And so I think promoting the legitimate use of privacy for uh, our financial systems in the jurisdictions that appreciate it will lead us to uh, being able to legitimize it in other jurisdictions like ours. Can I, can yeah, I keep please. going? Yeah, please. I would love okay. all of you guys to keep adding on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I live in Washington, D.C., and uh, everyone who I know who has organized a mass protest, uh, like the Women's March or, or other ones of you know, various ideo ideologies, they all use Signal to organize those, right? which is a private encrypted messaging app. And everyone I know who is a, is a staffer in Congress uh, in the House or the Senate, they all use Signal. And everyone I know who is an organizer for like women's healthcare uh, or uh, you know very, very, not always you know left ideologies or just across across the spectrum, like the people who are the most at risk of uh, government crackdowns or or being um, sought after because of their ideologies, no matter what it is, uh, and most at risk of violence happening to them because of the things that they're standing up for and the things that they believe in. Those are the people that uh, need privacy the most and, and see it. And so there, there is a segment in our society, in American society, that values privacy, even if I think most people are willing to give it up for convenience. Um, and showing people across every political divide and ideological divide that privacy is like a fundamental human right and, and makes your, your life better um, also creates a more peaceful society because um, they're, you're less able to, to target people based on ideology. So um, yeah, I think, I think you know, having uh, privacy, if you ever meet someone that is like, oh, Tornado Cash is for North Korea, it's not, it's for normal people who want to uh, pay for healthcare or organize a protest of you know, the status quo. Um, it, it, it's for, it's for, you know, regular use cases and, and it can be for normal people too, right? And so crypto might not be for normal people right now, um, 
but the existing monetary system is not for peace uh, because because of its its transparency to uh, to bankers and, and to the government. So if we want to create a peaceful monetary system, I think it, privacy has to go hand in hand for sure. Did you just call me weird? Did I call you weird? No. So Crypto is not for normal people. Crypto is not not right now. I mean, do you, I mean, raise your hand if you're in the audience if you consider yourself a normal person. Yeah, like 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 five percent, right? Well, so it, pretty much what normalcy I said. is in the eye of the beholder. So most of us think we're unique exactly. individuals. Well, fiat currencies are backed by the regulatory authority of the fiat government, for the most part. Regulatory authority is enforced by the nation's police and military, typically. Warren Buffett, Peter Schiff, Elizabeth Warren, some of our favorite people, have said that cryptocurrency is hot garbage, or alluded in some sense to cryptocurrency being hot garbage, because they feel it's just ones and zeros with nothing backing it. Since BTC and ETH and other blockchain currencies are not protected by the Marines or Interpol, do the detractors of cryptocurrency actually have a good point? Can I, can I correct the question? Uh, uh, the U.S. dollar is not backed by the U.S. regulatory environment. Uh, right? We don't have a law that says you're not allowed to sell the U.S. dollar for other other currencies, and there's no law. You know, ch you know. I think China is, made, made a, a rule recently. You're not allowed to sell Chinese stocks because you know that will make them go down, right? So the the regulatory enforcement does not back any of the value of the dollar. Uh, uh, I I think it's mostly backed by the assets that the United States controls, which are you know primarily uh, uh, enforcement vehicles. Yeah, the of nation's violence. police and right. military. Right. right. So. Um, you know, and our enforcement that um, that oil trading is done in, in dollars, right? What would happen if Saudi Arabia decided to go with the BRICS currency and, and stop trading trading oil in dollars? I don't think it would go very well for them, um, for because of because of influence, because of you know the American influence, which is great for me as Ameri as an American. I love that. You know, it means uh, you know my dollars are are strong everywhere, and my open dollars are strong everywhere too. Um, but there is surely a better a better way to do it and to back money by math uh, instead of instead of by these these type of violent assets uh, and that's that's kind of the idea of peaceful money is uh, you know we can enforce agreements enforce these transactions whether you're buying and selling oil or something that's even more peaceful than oil uh, you know you can have those transactions and have those agreements enforced enforced by math. Uh, and to me, the backing of any peaceful money has to has to come down to um, the only thing that we know, the only way we know how to enforce agreements is uh, peacefully. I think right now is with smart contracts and and with math. So the the backing is is uh, you know is with math and and with assets that are are tied to smart contracts. Uh, yeah. Would so, anyone else like to correct yeah. my question? Um. So I think that we want, uh, we don't, uh, like, for, for, for getting to the whole uh, peaceful money thing, it's, you want the, it to be collateralized and basically things that don't have an army that you're implicitly paying seniorage to that funds the army, right? When you're holding dollars, most people don't think about it like this, but you are subsidizing the budget of the government that is using that money to go enforce the strength of the dollar by securing assets in the Middle East, typically the oil uh, transactions. And so uh, if you want to not have that, uh, you need to try to not have your money backed by those things and back it with Bitcoin and ETH and then try to ideally not have it be rug pullable. Uh, and this is one of the cool things that uh, Joseph was saying, where it's like, once you have blockchains, you actually reduce the incentive to make the money rug pullable in general, because you can have smart contracts that can conceivably outlive you. Uh, in every other currency issued in history, what happens is the issuer of the currency rationally decides, hey, I'm going to you know, rug a bit of this during my lifetime to pay for my crisis, because that's convenient for me. Uh, and so they, you know, make it worth a little less you know, metal, or they, uh, in 1971, they end the gold standard. If, if MakerDAO 
for example, said, hey, uh, we're no longer redeeming our DAI for the assets that are backing it, we would call that theft. But that's what the US government did to the entire planet in 1971, and then was then forced to set up what I call pool two for the US dollar, uh, which is enforcing with the military that the oil is sold for dollars. And uh, sometimes it feels like it doesn't actually even matter who the president is, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, if the upholding of the dollar requires us to enter into military engagements. Uh, in or, like, and that is the, what we're trying to meme here in the sense of peaceful money is this combination of factors that have allowed us for maybe the first time in history to build systems that don't have to do that. And that can outlive us and not result in future generations being ridden with debt or war or what have you. Yeah, I think this question kind of perfectly encapsulates why we or why I at least am here in the first place and that that really, a lot of people think like that. You know, a lot of people hear Warren Buffett say crypto is dog shit and they're just, you know, like Warren Buffett's the smartest financial guy in the world and they just follow along with it. And you'd be surprised how many people I talk to outside of crypto that still think the dollar is backed by gold. Um, there's... People just don't really know how this works, and they, they take people like Warren Buffett and the other people you mentioned, and they kind of idolize them, put them up on a pedestal, and when they hear these things, they just take it for truth. And the reason why I'm here right now is I kind of, I want to show people that that's not the case, that we can create something that isn't you know, enforced by militaries, that can have value, that can be fair and transparent and you know, ethical, yeah. in a sense. Uh, and I'll add something. This is, is now my favorite panelist. He didn't <laughs> correct me. Yeah. Uh, you know. To some extent, right, if we're being honest, uh, there are Bitcoins being mined in America. And those Bitcoins are paying taxes to the US government, right? And so same with stakers being in America and paying taxes. And so, but you can do the math on like what fraction of the currency issuance is going into the war budget. Uh, and ideally, it'll be less. You know, it'll almost conceivably never be zero, but if we can minimize it, that would be cool. And so starting to talk about it is one way to make, you know, we have green this, farm raise that, and it's like, is your money peaceful? Like, have you guys even thought about that? We've thought a little bit about it, but we're thinking more about it now. Um, so now time for a question that uh, the panelists were quite excited about. Uh, can the philosophy of peaceful money be a large tent? Do the principles resonate with many different political philosophies, or is this just anarchy, capitalism only for socialists or for somebody else? It's definitely not for only for socialists. You know, we're all launching crypto protocols. Uh, you know, VC funded open dollar, or you know, a mean funded high, or you know, what? What? I, I would I would definitely not not call it uh, a, you know any part of crypto socialism. Um, maybe there's there's some you know universal basic income things there, but uh, those are uh, you know radical experiments too. Um, so is it a is it a big tent? Uh, you know, I think anyone who believes violence is bad, which is most people, not everyone. I definitely know some psychopaths. Okay, but uh, I would I would I would wager that most people think violence is bad and if we can do things that uh, lead to there being less violence globally between people uh, or between nation states or between you know alien races that we run into in the far future when we're still using smart contracts that are still deployed on ethereum you know thousands of years later uh, you know having less violence is good uh, worth pursuing and the more people that uh, join, join the big tent and, and join uh, uh, the ideology of, of peacefulness and working towards a more peaceful monetary, more peaceful and fair uh, monetary system, I, I, would, I would say that's, you know, something worth pursuing. Right. So peaceful money maybe isn't the thing for war hawks? Probably not, not for war hawks or uh, even if you're holding any, you know, every 401k in, in America is holding a little bit of Raytheon, right? Uh, which is not bad, right? You know, uh, Tomahawk missiles, super lit. Um, 
you know, maybe need a couple of those around for, for something. I think most people don't know I actually have a degree in naval science and studied ship weapon systems once a while ago. But uh, irrelevant, uh, you know. No, it's not irrelevant. That's good can, news. We can, we can defund, uh, not defund the police, you know, in that sense, but, you know, defund Raytheon and then there will be less missiles, right? Maybe good depending on what your ideology is. And we can defund, uh, uh, you know, coal power plants by bringing more capital to renewable energy. And whatever type of assets that you want to promote and you want to propagate in the world, you should back stable coins by them and let people make leveraged positions on those. And I want there to be more ETH because ETH is awesome and more people buying ETH and using it in more ways. So we'll make a stable coin backed by you know, ETH, which is a peaceful asset. If you want there to be more renewable energy, make a stable coin backed by renewable energy. If you want there to be more peace, make stable coins backed by peaceful assets. Uh, and and etc. And I, I think that should be open to you know many many different types types of assets and people with many different types of goals. Yeah, I'll, right. I'll add to this one. Uh, we like to think of crypto as a global movement. Like it's not just for America. It's not just for you know the third world countries. It's for everybody in between. Because inflation is essentially a scam that like every single country on the planet runs against its citizens. And it's more or less for lack of a better plan on the part of the citizens to be like, well, what else are we going to use to do our transactions? How else are we going to back money and use this? And because the government can inflate, they can steal from everybody and then use that money in nefarious ways for wars or violence and so forth. And so if people had you know, the understanding and ability to create their own assets, uh, their own currencies backed by real world assets like I got pitched on an almond backed uh, money that was pretty funny Ape. Uh, <laughs> uh, energy water reservoirs you know uh, electrical you know stuff uh, that would all be pretty cool and it would reduce the dependence of those people on the centrally issued currencies that then rob them in order, and then back up that uh, with violence. And so you're no longer, if you're using one of these stable coins that's backed by some peaceful you know, assets, you're no longer directly contributing to the cycle of violence. And so I think this is something that affects everybody on the planet, and we're basically all on the same team against the people who would try to use this, our, our currencies against us. Reza, do you have an opinion on whether or not this is for anarchists, socialists, or somebody else, or all three? I think these guys covered it perfectly. All right, sounds good. Now for a question that um, gets beyond just peaceful money and more into the broader topic of humanity. Some people believe that the only way for the crypto community to detach itself from prying, warlike, national governments is to establish a city-state with private security and military and pay an adjacent sovereign government for defense. If such a state was created, I have two questions. Would everyone agree on a single medium of exchange? If so, which one would that be? And also, I'd like to know how we would ensure population growth of a city-state in which 90% of the inhabitants were men. Yeah, I think she's seen the pictures of the network state meetups. Uh, I've um, walked by a couple and left. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, uh, city states, yeah, you're, so you're going to need some way of securing it, right? Like, that, there's no version of the world where you have a military budget that's a zero. Uh, it's mostly, if I was participating in this, what I would prefer is for the costs to be explicit. Right, like charge me taxes, let me do the math on whether or not I prefer the taxes. Don't rob me at the level of currency because you think I don't have a better plan. You know? uh, and, and then uh, if you, I, specifically about the medium of exchange thing, it's not necessary to have everybody have the same medium of exchange because you can charge taxes in kind for you know, what people are producing or the outputs and, you know, or allow several different currencies that you uh, adopt and if there's like liquid global markets for them, then it doesn't really you know, matter as a level of you know, necessity. 
Uh, where most people go wrong is they think they can get away with, oh, well, let's just print the money and then the next generation will pay for it. Uh, and I think that that would lead to a shorter term city state than the one I would be interested in building. Yeah, the, the business model of printing money, very good business model for the person doing the printing. So if your city state is owned by some very rich VCs and their business model is to print new money and all of the plebs use it and it's really good for them, that is a great idea uh, for the people that control that. Uh, right, so, you know, great, maybe, maybe it will work out for them. Uh, I happen to already belong to a digital city state. It's called RuneScape, uh, and I have a 20 year veteran cape. Okay, so, uh, you know, we have our own RuneScape gold currency. Uh, it's owned by a company, they can print an infinite amount of it. Um, the market cap of it is actually higher than um, it, would, it would probably be in the top, you know, five, five currencies globally. Um, because it's so inflated and valueless uh, uh, in, in its units, right? Um, so you know maybe it works out like that. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, anyone should be able to launch their own currency. I don't think the government should have a monopoly on creating currencies, right? Like, right? If if you want to make a gold-backed currency, like have fun. You should be able to do that. Uh, maybe it will. Maybe it will work. Uh, and certainly printing dollars or, or printing open dollars or printing, you know, whatever currency Balaji or anyone else wants to come up with this is a great business model. Uh, but maybe uh, things that a small group of people control and are able to always control the money supply will always end up with the same problems that we have with the U.S. dollar now. Uh, and things like open dollar or rye or high that are backed by a limited supply of ETH and can only be minted not by individuals but by a protocol that is permissionless, that is peaceful, that is backed by math and where monetary policies are controlled by a controller that is a smart contract which everyone agrees to participate in. Uh, maybe, maybe you know, that's worth pursuing. Maybe that would be a, a, lot, a lot better than what we have now. Well, it sounds like you guys are pursuing it. So hopefully some of these it. people yeah. use it. I'll, I'll add one more thing and that's just that like uh, the uh, you, you can, so like when we talk about the ability to, to mint the currency, like you can make the stable coin not have a, and then Joseph can mint the money, right? Uh, in the smart contract, it just doesn't have that function. So like people in theory in, you know, in the future should be able to trust these things more and for longer because they don't have the same risk of getting rug pulled in the way that our every fiat currency, which has a central bank, which in infinite print, uh, at any time does because that's essentially a giant honeypot waiting to happen uh, every time. So they'll tell you, hey, it's stable, inflation's going back to 2%, trust us. But then when they feel like it, they'll rug everybody's sense of stability for their own uh, gain to solve their crisis or whatever. And so blockchains give us this ability for like the first time in history to design these things and just be very transparent about the protocols and the rules and say, look, we don't even have the ability to print money. Like only the people who bring the assets can print the money and the protocol governs this. Yeah, I think what really jumped out from Joseph's answer was the, we said people can choose to participate. You, unless you have left wherever, whatever country you're from and came to America and like fought to get citizenship, you have not chosen to participate. You're kind of just like, you just did. Um, and I, I think that people should have the ability to opt in or opt out of their medium of exchange. Um, and when it comes to like whether we need some sort of you know military to protect this uh, mythical state, like, I don't really have a problem paying for protection. I want to be safe. I just think it should be explicitly stated, you know, like hey, I'm using this, and by using this, I am paying. I'm making sure no one comes into my house and robs me. You know, just transparency and the ability to opt in and opt out. All right, uh, these are all great responses. Uh, no one actually got at how we would ensure population growth of these network states that are 90% men. But I'd like to posit my own response. I think harems should be allowed for the women that join them. But right. uh, it'll be a somewhat sparing application. I, we hear some clapping in the audience. <laughs> yeah, the, it's a light clap. <laughs> this is uh, Thank you. I think you have a novel solution to the supply and demand problem here. Can I, uh, can I announce, do a, a small announcement? Um, uh, yes, you up? are. 
allowed to do that. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're announcing today the um, Peaceful Money Alliance at peacefulmoney.org, and you can sign up now to uh, be part of a, a new peaceful monetary system where we're planning to do uh, peaceful ratings and rate different currencies based on their peacefulness um, and, and more things from there. So peacefulmoney.org, and yeah, please sign up. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll give a last minute shill about our projects too. So Yes, please. Uh, if you want to see the best, coolest website ever made, go to letsgethigh.com, spelled H-A-I. Uh, the DMT elves will greet you, and uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. Got an open dollar shill? Opendollar.com, it's awesome. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, you guys. This was super fun for me. Um, we'll see you all later. <laughs>